Now, uh, this is actually a three-year study. Um, back three years ago, we purchased broodstock from a commercial dealer rather than use fish uh, from our Lincoln University improved bluegill. And uh, we wanted to determine if we could make up a different diet which would cost much less than a standard trout diet because bluegill are carnivorous and uh, in the past we've had the best results on a 40-12 diet which is a standard trout finishing diet. This is a, just a picture of the diets and the approximate composition. We use silver cup as a standard diet and it had 41% protein, 12% lipid. And uh, it showed what the oil uh, content was. The least cost formulation had 41% protein, 7% lipid and only 90% uh, of the, uh, or 10% of the oil was made out of uh, fish oil. 35% of the total fat was from poultry meal. Now this is kind of an ingredient list, and uh, Dr. Hayward at uh, University of Missouri, Columbia uh, is the one that made out the diet. And the original diet included the major ingredient as uh, porcine meal. I think it shows it right there. But uh, we did not include it in, in our diet, mainly because we thought uh, why should we test the diet with porcine meal in it when there are groups of people that don't like to eat products that have uh, porcine meal in them or any kind of thing like that. And that's what we can tell the control diet or our standard diet. And this actually is cost per ton, estimated cost per ton. And truly, uh, fish meal, there was only 10% fish meal. The rest of the protein component in this diet was made up of poultry byproduct meal. In our area, we have a tremendous uh, number of turkey farmers and uh, chicken farmers. And... Uh, so poultry byproduct meal is uh, pretty easy to get. And uh, then we had some processed uh, blood meal and 10% uh, in fish meal. The rest of the diet was pretty standard. Uh, unfortunately, this was a floating diet and I felt we did after we did the analysis that we had too much carbohydrate in there, and in the end, on the two-year-old fish, the liver showed that it was too much carbohydrate in the diet. And in fact, the best growth I've ever had on sunfish, and when I'm talking about, I'm putting sunfish in the whole group together, has always been on a slow-sinking feed. Sunfish do not like to come up during the middle of the day for a floating feed, even in the morning if the sun is overhead. So we've always had the best luck on a slow sinking feed. Now, however, slow sinking feeds are very difficult to feed for a fish farmer because you don't have any idea what's there. And you have to be really careful that you don't overfeed if you have mortalities or something in a pond situation because you won't see those dead fish unless you see great blue herons carrying, carrying them off, which they do. And that's one of the problems with using standard bluegill 
is they nest in very shallow water. And as you well know, their nests are very close together, and the males are particularly vulnerable to birds that uh, like to pick them off, and they do 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 it. And of course, uh, they're considered uh, waterfowl, and it's very difficult to get permits in order to control those type of birds. And even if you're lucky enough to get get a permit, maybe you can only shoot 12 a year, and only with a shotgun. Well, after you shoot the first one, a shotgun doesn't work on great blue herons because our ponds are farther away from our building than a football field, and the minute you open the door, the birds are gone. So they learn in a hurry. Anyway, the objective of that, using consistent protocols to evaluate the performance. Now, this is phase two I'm talking about. Phase one was done uh, between Lincoln University, Purdue University, and Iowa State University. Phase uh, two, which is the final grow out, was done between Lincoln University and University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. Anyway, using uh, consistent protocols, performance of H2 bluegill fed the diet, 41% pro protein, 8.3% lipids. And we compared that with a uh, standard diet, which we mentioned in, I mentioned in the beginning. Now we did this at two different latitudes, and unfortunately, I don't have the uh, information from Chris Hartley at this time, but I can tell you that there was not a great deal of difference between the final results of the two diets. Procedures. This is uh, Lincoln and uh, University of Wisconsin, and we had all the same procedures. Uh, they were stocked in earthen ponds, and actually our fish, which are the two-year fish, were pooled after the one-year study was done, and 700 were stocked in each quarter-acre pond or a tenth hectare pond. So. Uh, the results of the first phase of the study then did not affect the results of the second because those fish were pooled. <clears throat> and a standard number of fish from each one of the groups then was stocked into each of the earthen ponds. This is a picture, the quarter acre ponds are the ponds over here, and uh, they were all stocked the same day, and then they were put on feed uh, a day later, and they were continued for 180 days, and then they were harvested at the end of that 180 day period. Uh, fish were fed to a parent cessation amount they could consume in 15 minutes using uh, three to four feeding rings. We use feeding rings with floating feed because uh, we do have some uh, standard southwest breezes in the summer and it tends to blow the feed away from the fish and pile it up against the opposite side of a pond. So we feed only in feeding rings in a and again, I'm not sure that that's really good for bluegill because uh, they don't really like to concentrate under a feeding ring like other fish do. But uh, if you're using a floating feed, it will blow away because uh, bluegill feed differently than most fish. They pop up and take some, and then they pop up and take And it's kind of a consistent thing over time, 
but they don't feed like a hybrid striped bass, for example, or like a shark feed. They're not feeders like that. They feed very slowly. Um, we fed uh, every day that way, except uh, on uh, Sunday, and we didn't feed at all, and we just calculated the total amount of feed for the week. And we did that to try to save on uh, student labor. Uh, we normally feed our fish at uh, daylight and just before dark. However, um, the people at Wisconsin couldn't hire students that would feed that early and that late. So, <laughs> so we had to go to a 8 o'clock, 5 o'clock schedule which wasn't the best for the fish, especially bluegill. You still have a lot of sunlight. Uh, like I mentioned, these fish were harvested in October, and what we did is uh, we drew the pond down about halfway. We have simple structures in our ponds. That's uh, a pipe with a uh, Arkansas swivel on it, and you just take that swivel and you put it where you want it to draw down as much water as you would like and uh, it's very simple. And we seen, we seen out probably 90% of the fish before we completely drain the pond and take the rest. We took uh, 200 fish samples from each pond and uh, these fish were filleted. The, they were filleted and they were, each individual fish was weighed and measured. And each individual, individual fish had uh, gut and gill removed first. And that was weighed. And uh, somatic index was provided. And then uh, out of these 200 fish uh, samples, 20 fillets were taken and homogenized. They were subsampled, and the subsamples were frozen with uh, very rapid with uh, dry ice, and those samples then were later taken for approximate analysis. This is the people working up the fish in the room. And uh, we use uh, fillet knives, ma uh, mainly electric ones, because people who aren't used to doing it get a more uniform product. Now, it'd be nice if you had a machine, but those types of things don't exist in the universities anyway. No, yes, sir. Chuck, do you have uh, some numbers on dress out percentages for this fish? Well, uh, I'll get to that. But this was, these people were novices that did this this year, and their dress, dress outs were between 21 and 25 percent. When we did it on our bluegill, uh, and we were very careful when we sampled, when, it, when we did our growth studies, we averaged 33%. And that's, that's kind of the industry standard, is about 33%. So now, these are ending weights of each one of the trials. And you can see that there are very little difference between them. Number one and number two. Number one being the standard and two, the, the test diet. If you would uh, use least square means and uh, determine differences, uh, it was slightly significant at the 5% level, but uh, I would say essentially it was very similar. So we could say that under the circumstances that we uh, use this feed that the results were very, very similar. Now that's too much data in there, but I did this just to see if there were some 
pond by diet differences. And these, of course, again, are estimates <coughs> based on differences in least square means. And there were some significant differences, but actually it may have been the pond effect more than it was the uh, diet effect because if you guys remember, uh, this was done last summer, we had a tremendously difficult summer in the Midwest and we didn't get any rain from May until January or February and our water temperatures were way up in the 90s and that's really not very good for sunfish. So we it, it affected a lot of things. And that's how that's again how we prepared the samples for approximate analysis. This was the results and I see when I transferred that it didn't come out right but uh, again everything was the same protein, lipid, and ash. There's almost no differences. And you can see how low that dress out was. But again, this, these were novices. These are people that we get as volunteers to do this. Uh, then they get to take home some fillets. And uh, when they're first starting out, it, it doesn't work very well, actually. So again, we can say it. This diet in particular, it uh, really did not produce any differences. And I want to mention again that we felt that the carbohydrate level was too high. And that is true of most floating feeds with sunfish because it's used as a binder and used in, a, in floating feeds. And so it's very, very difficult to get it low enough to where it won't affect the livers. And the livers were creamy white looking, indicating maybe high levels of, uh, of carbohydrates. Survival and conversion was a real problem with us last summer. And I don't think uh, really it had anything to do with diets. Conversions were terrible. And I, I believe that this was mainly due to uh, survival problems. And uh, what, what this was determined on, gain was determined on total weight of the pond. If you take individual size least square means and determine gain, it was pretty good. And the SGR actually... Uh, was satisfactory for that size of a fish. It was in the 0.8 to 0.9 range, so it was satisfactory. However, one pond, we had a 47% survival, and again, we think this was mainly due to temperatures and some disease problems that were not treated because we didn't want to treat them. Uh, this is our contact, my contact information. Uh, 